33 years ago, I sat right where you're sitting now. Well, nearly. It was the first lecture of uh, my yacht design course down the road at Solent University. But I'm a journalist now, and I've been the technical editor of Yachting World for the last 23 years. So I quite like techie stuff. But back then, in 1981, when I started at Solent University, there were no computers. And there were certainly no laptops and certainly no tablets. A mouse was still something that the cat brought in. And that touchscreen technology was the stuff of pure science fiction. And the computers that I first had access to had paper rolls. They did not have screens. My daughter doesn't believe this, but they had paper rolls, like kitchen rolls. But by the time I'd finished my three-year course, computers were starting to make an impact. But they were very basic. You could forget hard drives. You can forget USBs. There was none of that, not for us anyway. We stored our data on cassette tapes. But there were no mobile phones either. And when they, when they did come, they were literally the size and weight of a house brick. There's no wonder our trousers were quite so baggy with those things in them. But when it came to boats and navigation, the really big step was one to have one of these. And I think, Michael, you've got an example there. Thank you. One of these. Ridiculous, really, isn't it? Look at the size of it. But in the 80s, this was a really, really big deal. In fact, the boat that I raced on in the 80s for offshore, we had one of these, and it was a huge advantage. So what is it? It's a Decker Yacht Navigator 2, lots of buttons, and two displays. That's all, latitude and longitude. It just gives you some numbers that you can plot on a chart. That's it. That's all it did for all that size. I mean, admittedly, you could actually sail, you could set it up so you sail to a waypoint. It would give you some idea of your relative position to where you were going. But that was it. But in the 1980s, that was a very, very big deal. But now, <coughs> jumping ahead, we're all talking about these. I'm sure just about everybody's got a smartphone. And, of course, we all know that they can do everything under the sun. Send texts, surf the net, play music. They even make a phone call occasionally. But it's incredible. Book travel on them. But you can also turn it on and find out wherever you are in the world. It's phenomenal to think that you can do that and see a map of where you are in the world and zoom in and find your own house compared to that. In fact, one of the, something that came into my inbox, or in tray, I should say, the other day, was one of these. It's an anemometer for an iPhone. I mean, it's ridiculous. <laughs> but it's not just, even then, that's not good enough. It's an anemometer that automatically transmits, using the app that you've downloaded, automatically transmits the wind speed of where you are and puts it on a map anywhere in the world. It's all about the ultimate crowdsourcing wind measuring device. I mean, it makes you wonder if there's anything that an iPhone can't do. So, I mean, the, the important thing in that over 30 years, the progress in technology has been absolutely phenomenal. But many of you will have started with these iPhones and tablets and this kind of technology. So you may well be asking, one, what on earth am I talking about? And two, is it likely that we're going to see such an enormous leap in technology in the next 30 years? Well, that's a very difficult question to answer. And that's actually partly why we're here today. Because the marine industry has always played a very big part in the development of modern electronics. Satellite navigation is a very, very good example of that. The marine industry, whether it's leisure or commercial, were very early adopters of satellite navigation for obvious reasons. Chart plotters are probably my favourite example. I mean, we had chart plotters in yachts donkey's years before we ever had the in-car navigation systems that we all take for granted now. We were way ahead of the trend. And then there's satellite communication. Again, marine was early adopters of this, this technology. So with all that in mind, and the progress and the development, and in order to try and answer a few questions as to 
where it's all going. We've um, put together a diverse um, panel of experts over here that are going to help us understand um, what's available, the challenges of uh, installation, and where the whole scene's going. So let me introduce our panel. I'll start with um, Alex, this is Dr. Alex Reed from um, Cosworth. He's the technical manager at Cosworth. Now, those of you who follow motorsport will be no strangers to be well aware of Cosworth. They're a big name in motorsport, but they're not so well known in the marine trade. So, Alex, tell us a bit about what Cosworth do and what your, what your role is. Right. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm a technical manager at Cosworth. Um, I look after the marine side of the business. Um, my main customers are actually the America's Cup teams uh, and the Volvo Ocean Race, uh, but also I look after Olympic teams and any other big racing performance packages. Thank you very much, Alex. Moving on to William Collier. William, you're the managing director of GL Watson, who are a, a very well-known yacht design studio, and you specialise in the restoration project management of um, classic yachts. Um, you're also a historian. Um, tell us a little bit about, uh, about your world. Well, GL Watson's was the first dedicated yacht design studio ever created in the world, which means that we're now the oldest, inevitably. Um, in its early years, it was very much at the forefront of technology. Did the first uh, tank test trials on America's Cup Challengers in the turn of the century, turn of the 19th, 20th century. Designed four Challengers, a lot of big steam yachts. And in the 10 years since I've been involved in the company, our main activity has been restoring large classic yachts. Great. Nigel Crane is uh, the um, European Marine OEM sales manager of Garmin. And I'm sure many of us, if not all of us, are fully aware of Garmin. They're one of the biggest players in the market, particularly in the mass market. Tell us a bit about Garmin and, and your role there, Nigel. Thanks, Matt. Yes, well, Garmin is a company that really came about when GPS technology was in its infancy and have grown with GPS as it's moved on forward. We're involved in many aspects of GPS technology. Um, aviation for aeroplanes is a big part of what we do, um, obviously marine. In-car sat-navs, you've probably all seen a, a Garmin sat-nav um, going to Halfords any time they're, they're all there. Even down to things like golfing watches, which will tell you, as soon as you walk onto the first tee on any golf course anywhere in the world, it will tell you where you are and where the, where the pin is. Um, and as you walk around, it helps you find your way around the golf course. It doesn't help you hit it any straighter, but <laughs> it does help you find your way around. My job is uh, I look after the marine side, looking, particularly looking after selling to the boat builders throughout Europe. So that's what I'm here for. Excellent. Rachel Oliver is a director of Osprey Technology, and uh, a large part of Rachel's work is with uh, Grand Prix boats like this, and uh, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with those. Very high-tech kit, right at the leading edge of, of what the sport can do. Rachel, tell us a bit about Osprey Technology and your involvement. Yeah, thanks, Matt. That's right. We're working with primarily uh, Grand Prix offshore race yachts. Uh, we specify the um, design of the electrical and electronic systems. We'll then install that system, uh, commission it, set it up, do all the calibration, and then work with the team going forwards um, to support the system um, onshore and also remotely while the, while the boats are doing their races. Great. So there's the panel that we're going to be talking to. But before we look at what they do in a bit more detail, I'd like to just take a look at an area of the sport that has consistently played quite a big part in pushing on the technology in the marine field. And that's the America's Cup. The last year was one of the most dramatic ever. I'm sure a lot of you a lot of you saw it. Let's just have a quick reminder of just why it was so special. Imagine if these guys lost from here. What an upset that would be. That'd be one hell of a story. That'd be one hell of a comeback. That's my motivation. 
One hell of a story, said um, Jimmy Spittle. You're not kidding. It certainly was. But that cycle of the America's Cup not only represented an in incredible comeback for the Americans, it also represented probably one of the biggest leaps in technology that we've ever seen in sailing. So my first question is to, is to Alex. Alex, the America's Cup is always being compared to Formula One. I mean, is that a fair comparison? Does it stack up? Thanks. Um, yeah, I think that's a, that is a fair question now, actually. A few years ago, there was quite a, quite a gap in terms of the electronics uh, between Formula One and the America's Cup. But I think certainly with what we've just seen in the last Cup, uh, that's actually narrowed quite a lot now. Um, typically, um, you now typically run one of these boats like you run a, run a race car. Um, there's a lot more sensors now on the boats. Um, and typically, because the boats are so much bigger, you might have more sensors on a boat like an America's Cup boat than a, uh, a top-level Formula car. How many sensors are we talking about? Uh, typically, teams will run about 1,000 channels of data um, at high rates, so be that from fibre optic information or... Uh, versus areas. how many in a Formula One car? How many channels? Um, you're probably looking at about 700, 750. Right. So, so in many ways, you could say that the America's Cup is actually ahead. It's becoming more demanding. Yes, certainly in that area. And do the rules, I mean, are you in Formula One, do the rules cause a problem with how many channels you can monitor? Um, certainly the, the rules are a lot more restricted in Formula One. Um, what we're seeing now in America's Cup is where Formula One used to be kind of 10, 15 years ago where active ride height control and two-way telemetry were allowed. Um, so certainly America's Cup is, a, is very open and it's very exciting at the moment. No doubt, I, I, I think in the future they probably will restrict what you can do more. Mm. And so what kind of data? You talk of a 1,000 channels. What kind of data is being recorded on the cut boats? Um, typically, you'll have um, a lot of uh, structural data. So that will be in two forms, either fibre optic or from load pins um, or even optically. Um, you, you will also then have um, a lot of uh, performance data. Typically, the teams run a lot of gyros on board, um, a lot of pressure sensors. Um, so typically on these boats, you're moving a lot of things, be that board height rudders, um, uh, loads or winches, speed of pedestals, the performance of the human on board as well. So there's all these channels merged together. How on earth do you watch all of that? I mean, do the crews watch all those? A thousand channels? I can only watch well, one but, TV channel. But yeah. How, how, do you, how do they, I mean, are they watching it on the boat or are there people off the boat that are monitoring it? Or? Um, the, the, crew, the crew basically monitor the essential channels. So they, they, don't, they only care about the channels that they need to sail the boat quickly. Um, they, they will be alerted if there are any alarms. Um, but typically there will be a team on the chase boat uh, and on shore who will monitor all the channels Typically, all the channels will have alarms associated with them, whether that's a sensor failure or a load exceeded. Um, and typically, the guys on board don't need to worry about it until they hear in their earpiece or see on their iPhone or iPad that something's gone wrong. Mm. And so why, why are they measuring it? I mean, how so they can see this data, but where's it all going? What, what's it achieving? So a lot of the data really is, is, uh, is really intended for the design team. Um, so typically in motorsport you have a very strong loop between the, the CFD area, the wind tunnels and then what happens on the track. You try and tie, those, tie that into a big loop, improving your CFD model, improving um, performance basically throughout. And typically sailing has actually been quite weak at doing that um, compared to motorsport. It's so much more difficult to be fair. It, your track's moving all the time. But people are now instrumenting the cup boats more to almost use it as a virtual wind tunnel. Mm. So measuring pressures on sails, on wings, and trying to get as much information, certainly at the beginning of the campaign, as they can. Fascinating stuff. Well, you've got to like numbers, haven't you, really? Yeah. <laughs> That's the key. Uh, continuing the America's Cup theme, last year, with the 
multi-house and the cats. I mean, that wasn't a one-off for anybody who follows the America's Cup. They'll be well aware of that because the America's Cup has always been at the leading edge of design and uh, technology, and not just for the design of the boats. Racing yacht instrumentation actually started in the America's Cup. And here, I think, yes, there it is. It's one of the most famous of uh, all the America's Cup boats. I'm sure many of you will recognize that as being Endeavour. Um, that was launched uh, originally back in 1934. So, William Collier, what part did the J-Class play in the development of modern instrumentation? I think uh, the key thing there was the new generation of owners coming in, and typically uh, someone like Southworth, who owned Endeavour, with his aeronautical background and a big engineering team, bringing his technical know-how and really taking the boatyard, in that case, Camper Nicholson's, on a bit of a journey. So Endeavour should be regarded as a Camper Nicholson's hull and a Sopwith-provided rig in many ways. And uh, Sopwith deputed uh, an engineer from Hawker Engineering to Camper Nicholson's, a guy called Frankie Murdoch, who I knew towards the end of his life very well. And Frankie designed the rig. He pioneered rod rigging for the first time ever on a J-Class, which was pretty ambitious, and designed the first wind speed and wind direction indicators, as well as winches and all sorts of other gizmos to mm. uh, help them win. And I think we've got, yes, we've got a picture here, actually this one up in the, in the top left corner there is actually a sketch of the uh, original uh, wind instrument. I think you were telling me the other day about how that actually worked. Yeah, I mean, the, the, wind, the wind speed indicator was, uh, was a very primitive system. It was just two uh, electric coils. One was shielded and the other one wasn't, and it worked on the temperature differential between these two coils, but it gave them a reading. The problem they had was the 165-foot mast. They were getting a wind speed at the top of the mast and not maybe what was crossing the deck. Uh, so they had very you know, problems with that that they were discovering as a result of this technology. And the, uh, the wind direction indicator was a far simpler device, um, very similar to what we have today still. And I hear and read that, that actually the owner, Sopwith, was sort of criticised almost for spending too much time looking at instruments and not enough time sailing the boat. Well, we all know people who sail by their instruments and uh, anyone who's crewed with them has been frustrated by that. And uh, certainly the stories are that Sopwith did get rather obsessed with staring at the instruments and he certainly had the faster boat and he didn't win. So that's inevitably going to attract uh, a degree of blame. And that's probably possibly one of the reasons is he wasn't as focused on the boat itself and the sea as he could have been. Mm -hmm. Moving into, into your world and your, your area where you're working now, I mean, what, what are owners of classic yachts today, what are they looking for in instrumentation? Well, if we're looking at, at classic motor yachts, this is about as small as we'd get involved in and they get bigger from there. So the owners are not involved in the navigation side and things like that. That's not something that primarily interests them. It's there, it's for the professional crew to use. So they're looking at communication ability. They want to be in permanent Wi-Fi zone. You know, typically, they are very attached to their iPads and whatever they're using. That's absolutely vital to them. They're also looking to bring their own entertainment on board, their choice of music, their choice of films, and things like that. So when they get on a boat, they're really looking for connectivity in the same way that they'd expect to have it on shore or anywhere else. Um, and they're not really compromising on that at all. They're also interested in the classic yachts and not having a boat that looks like it's an aerial farm and where the aesthetics are very much the driving force of the restoration. They need us to incorporate all of these electronic infrastructure in a very discreet way if we can. So how do you, what are the problems involved with that? I mean, they want all this technology on board, but presumably it comes at a price more than just a financial one. Well, the, the, the problem is essentially space. Um, classic yachts were designed with very low headroom, typically, like old houses, and a modern yacht now would be built with about 600 mil of uh, coordination space above a finished deck head, and classic yachts were built with a couple of inches, maybe, or maybe it was just the underside of the deck painted originally, so we don't have that space. And uh, some of the guys from Penn Dennis here working on a project with us at the moment, probably struggling with incorporating uh, cabling into, into the boat that we're doing there. And that's, that's the typical problem is coordination space, and it's finding tricks to get that cabling through the boat, um, probably the biggest challenge. Mm. Thank you. Well, that's the world of, of Subiox, but Nigel, your world is a little bit different from that. You're obviously very well known, your company's very well known for the mass, the mass market um, and the, the rapid growth of marine electronics. What's been the biggest effect of, of modern instrumentation systems? Well, I, I think that companies such as, as, as Garmin and others involved in what I would call the mass uh, electronics market for navigation on yachts have helped in a number of ways to really increase the market and the availability to the public of, of going boating because 
previous to GPS, as we talked to, as you talked earlier on, it was it was quite difficult to know where you were when you went out to sea. What we've done is we've taken away some of that mystique, if you like. We've made it easy for people to be able to go out sailing, to enjoy themselves on the water, and safely as well. So they can now, it, to cross the channel now is, is a fairly straightforward navigationally um, exercise. It's no longer that difficult. Previously, you'd have to have a, an RDF system where you'd be listening for a null. I mean, systems that were very basic, and typically, when you got to the other side, you knew roughly where you were within maybe five to 10 mile radius, but now you're talking five to 10 meter, you would know where you are, or, best, or even better than that. So what we've done, I think, is we've, we've just opened it all up, and that has helped the market, helped boat builders to be able to sell more boats, because before, it was quite difficult. You almost needed to be a, a member of a secret sect to, to be able to go sailing and to navigate, whereas now, almost anybody can do it. Mm. You still need to know the basics, I, strongly believe that, and um, you need to have chart skills, but you can just get on the boat and very quickly learn your way around the chart plot and know where you are. You've got radar, you've got AIS, you've got autopilots, everything just to make it easier and to remove some of the fatigue and the, and the, the difficult things that were there previously. So a sort of demystification of, of totally. navigation, I guess. Yeah. Uh, uh, what about the handheld, uh, handheld technology? I mean, how has that affected things? Sure, I mean, the iPad generation, the iPhone, whatever, um, Androids, everything coming in, people will want to use these on, on, the, on the boat, but there still are challenges with, with them in so much as you, your, your battery life's low, they're not waterproof, um, they don't work too well in the sunshine. You, you try looking at your iPad in the sunshine, it just doesn't work too well, and that's where you want to be on a boat. All of the latest devices now will have full Wi-Fi links through them as well. So you can still see them on your iPad. If you're down below, you want to work on at the chart table, you could use your iPad down there. Driving your whole system, you could still see your radar up on your iPad now. But I think that really, it, we're still a little way from handhelds taking over. People still want to have a rugged chart plotter system on board the boat that you can have covered in water, it doesn't matter. I mean, the system we've got out in the foyer there, you can wash it down with a hose at the end of the day if you want to. You wouldn't want to do that with your iPad. Mm. And, how do, and do you see that having a, having a, a knock-on effect further on down the line? Are we going to see instrumentation systems set up in a different way at all? Quite possibly, yes. I think that the, 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 the external system will be quite different to what you might want to have down below at the chart table, and you'll just be linking it and repeating it. And so at the, it. at the moment, most of the hardcore stuff is, is down below, and people are playing with iPads up on deck. <laughs> exactly. do, you see, do you see a reversal of that? I, totally, yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah. I think it, would, it makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Uh, William, have you, have you seen, we just, you've just been talking a bit about the instrumentation and, and owners bringing stuff on board. I mean, has... Have these handheld devices, iPads, iPhones, tablets, or has that had an effect in your world, in the classic oh, world? Oh, absolutely, because uh, we, rather than having the nightmare system of multiple re remote controls, be it for lighting or curtains and blinds and music, everything just gets grouped onto an iPad. And because they are so intuitive in the way that people use them, guests on a, on a super yacht will not be at all surprised to find an iPad in their cabin, to switch it on and to leave through menus and go, oh, look, I can change the air conditioning, I can change the lighting, I can call for a drink, and I can do any of these things on the mm -hmm. iPad. And this is, this is pretty usual for them, and uh, they, they will just use it. They don't need to have the, kind of, the, the instruction manual that everyone used to get in their cabin. It's now on the iPad, and they'll just pick it up and get on with it. Sounds just like life at home to me, actually. Yeah, all yeah, the time. Yes. Dial it up, breakfast, please. <laughs> it's interesting, actually, that that technology from the super yacht industry is now working its way down into the more normal boats as well. We're now seeing digital switching on board, on board sort of 40, 50 foot yachts as against the several hundred foot yachts that you're talking about. And it's, it's now coming into that system. So it's, it's getting there. We're working towards it. And more and more um, boat builders are adopting that. Mm, interesting. Well, it's all very well talking about... Um, systems for high-end and, and uh, mass market boats and the rest of it, but at some stage it's got to be installed, and I know William um, has already talked a bit about that. But um, our next uh, speaker, Rachel Oliver, she's involved, as we said earlier on, with install installation systems on some of the world's most advanced boats. And just before we, we talk to her about it, let's just have a look at what we're really talking about. Hi, my name is Rachel and I am looking after the electronic systems on board for Alex during the build-up to the Vendée Globe. 
and during the race I'll be technical support on the other end of the phone for him. Um, this is the nav station on board and this is where Alex will spend a large chunk of his time. The navigation station actually swivels so he can always sit himself in the best position to be comfortable and have his weight in the right place while he's racing. Most of the electronics on board are channeled back to around this area so he doesn't need to move around the boat and everything's easy to get at. Everything's pretty much turned on and off here and all of the information he needs to see are on these screens. Um, um, the other thing that he does from here as well as planning his routes is monitoring all of the boat instrument data. We've got lots of systems on board for monitoring the weather, the boat speed. He's got a lot of different controls that he can play with and his instruments help him to check that he's actually running at his optimum all of the time. Well, it doesn't really look much like my boat, but um, it looks more like the space station to me, but I'm sure it's, uh, I'm sure it's second nature to you, Rachel. What, given the high-tech nature of the boats that you, you deal with, what sets these ones apart from, say, a, a normal installation? What, why are they so different behind the scenes? Well, obviously, reliability is paramount on a boat like this. Um, typically, these boats are raced by one person um, non-stop around the world. It takes them three months. So if anything stops working, that's a disaster and it's potentially the end of the race. So the installation really has to prioritise reliability um, above uh, weight saving and performance. Obviously, weight saving and performance are also very, very important, and it, we're always trying to strike a very fine balance um, between between those. So also in the installation, we've we've got to bear in mind that potentially we've got a non-technical tired person. Um, that's going to have to remedy um, any issues on board. So we spend a huge amount of time working out um, the, the optimum layout so that um, everything is clear and labelled and accessible um, so that should a problem arise, um, we can talk the skipper through fixing pretty much any issue. So when an owner turns up with a specification list and this is, this is what I want to do, how, where do you go from there? I mean, do you just open all the boxes up and go and fit it? Or how, how does the process work? Well, we'll spend um, two to three times uh, as long planning the installation as actually doing the installation. A lot of that is getting a really good understanding of what the skipper's requirements are. Um, there's obviously personal preference that comes into it as well and certain restrictions um, that maybe come down to the physical size of the skipper. Um, so once we've got a really good understanding of their requirements, uh, we obviously have to adhere to certain class rules as well um, and take into um, consideration uh, technolo uh, technological developments that we think are in the pipeline. Um, and then when we've got a really thorough plan, we'll embark upon the installation. Hmm. I mean, Alex, you work in a similar sort of field, a similar high-tech end. Does that, does that ring a bell with you? I mean, how, how do the installations go? Do you have to do a lot of planning on the boat or does it happen on a, somewhere else? Or? Yeah, um, typically we do, a, uh, we, we do a lot of planning, kind of looking at the boat to begin with. Um, and, but, in terms of the wiring and the, um, and the systems on board, we manufacture all the wiring um, off-site um, and then it's just fitted onto the boat exactly the same way as how it would be done on a car. Um, and it's all tested to, to military-type standards. Um, it's also designed in, to be as light and reliable and strong as possible. Mm. And, and in your market, uh, Nigel, I mean the mass market, how, how important has installation been? Has that been an area that you've spent some time working on? It, it's an area that we've made some significant improvements on over the years. I've been involved with marine electronics now for about 20 years. And during that time, what we've done is we've tried to make it a lot easier and quicker for the boat builders to be able to install it. We're, we're talking about mass market here. They're building a lot of boats. They want to be able to 
somebody on the line that wants to be able to install it, they, they cut the hole, they, they fit it in, and then connect it up. They don't want to have to make, too difficult, don't make it too difficult. And that means if it does have a problem, it's then easy to swap it out or to trace something that's, on, uh, that's broken down on the system. Mm. So we try to keep it simple. It's all color coded now, and diff different, different things will only fit in certain holes. So it's, it's relatively straightforward now. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> yeah, what could? <laughs> Um, Rachel, I'm just thinking about power issues now. I mean, we're talking about all this glorious sort of electronic stuff, and at home, I'm sure many of us are quite used to having multi-plugs and cables all over the place with chargers and God knows what plugged in. How do you deal with that on a boat? Is power an issue on a boat? Yeah, obviously power is, is critical um, to running all of the essential systems on board. Um, this boat here is a good in, uh, example of um, one of these round-the-world race yachts that... Um, uses a lot of renew renewable energy sources. Uh, so now you'll see boats using hydro generators, uh, which is like a little propeller that drags along behind the boat um, and generates um, about four times as much power as we actually need to run the boat. Um, so we can charge the battery, the battery system from, from the excess power. Um, also uh, advance, advancements in solar panel technology are still fairly rapid, and we're seeing uh, the weight and efficiency improve uh, radically. So solar panels are, again, a really good option. Um, and also the wind generators, um, which have been around for, for a long time. You see them on many, many boats in, in marinas, uh, will kick out a fair amount of power as well. Uh, so we would use a combination of renewable sources um, as sort of backups, really, to also running a generator or um, alternators on, on the main engine. And, and what kind of power are we talking about? What do you, try, what do you need to generate? Um, to run your, your bare essentials, uh, you're looking at about 200 watts. Um, if you want to browse Facebook um, um, and chat on Skype to your mates, then obviously your power consumption is going to go up, but uh, about 200 watts for your, for your basics. Well, looking at some of those scary pictures there, I think I'd want to be down below browsing Facebook and talking to my mates and calling someone to get me out of there. But anyway, <laughs> that might need a bit more than 200 watts. <laughs> but they get the message anyway. Um, thank you, Rachel. Thank you, everybody. Uh, in a moment, we're going to be opening up the floor to your questions because I can just feel that you're absolutely gagging to ask some questions. But um, whilst you're thinking about that, um, there's just a few other, other topics that I'd like to sort of cover. Well, actually, to be honest, following on from what Rachel was talking about... Um, Alex, power requirements for modern, modern technology, is that, are they coming down for you or are they going up? Or? Um, typically, the, uh, they, they're coming down, really. Uh, in, terms of the, in terms of cup yachts, um, there's not nearly as much power required as for your super yachts or your um, everyday yachts. Um, typically, you're only looking at two, three amps per, per output. Um, but yeah, ma ma mainly the power is actually human driven, really. So right. <laughs> generating that hydraulic pressure. Yeah. And, and William, in your world, I guess, on super yachts, I mean, power, you've got oodles of it. You'll probably be selling it back to the national grid, I guess. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the consumption of the electronic factors is not a major you know, draw on the, on the ship's power network. But there is a kind of um, avalanche that happens where you put more electronics in suddenly you need to put more air conditioning in to chill the electronics that you've put in, or you put more lighting in and you actually need to chill the room because the lighting's making it too hot. And so the lighting doesn't consume very much, the electronics doesn't, but the air conditioning does. And we do end up having issues around those kind of factors. So more, more power to deal with more power. That's right, yes. Mm. Yeah. Sounds rather American to me, but there we go. It is. <laughs> and Nigel, in your word, is power a big issue for... For consumer. Not really, not for the consumer. He's the typical consumer. I mean, first of all, the actual products themselves, the processes have become a lot more efficient than they used to be 10 years ago. Um, also, pumping out more light at, for, for, for less power. Um, all, they're also, most of them are used on a daily basis. People are not doing round the world trips typically with the sort of products that we're doing. It's a day trip. They're out for the day with their friends and they're going to be running engines from time to time. If it's a motor yacht, then it's not an issue at all. They're just running power. Modern batteries are so, so good as well that we really, power is not a big consideration. Obviously, you've got to check it out, but it's not something that we worry about too much. Mm, interesting. And Rachel, we talked about um, 
high technology and, and the leading edge of technology and the rest of it and the advanced boats that you're working on, given the rate that modern technology is advancing at, how tempting is it to go for the very sort of leading edge electronics or do you have to sort of hold yourself back and, and stick with a more tried and trusted? Is there a balance to be struck there? Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned before, obviously reliability is um, king on, on these sorts of boats. So while we are obviously looking for uh, the technical edge, we have to be 100% certain that, that the systems we use are going to be reliable 100% of the time. So um, we work very closely with, with our equipment manufacturers. Uh, we have a pretty good idea of um, what developments are coming through. Um, but typically, within the final year of preparation, we won't be changing uh, any of the technology on board, um, other than perhaps the old software update. And then within the last three months of preparation, we wouldn't be changing anything at all. Uh, whether you know something much better appeared to be available, it just wouldn't be worth compromising the reliability of the system at that stage. So there was no last-minute update to iOS 8 then? <laughs> I wish I hadn't. Anyway, and um, William, uh, that sort of raises a, a, an interesting issue in your market because one of the boats that you're probably best known for is Narlin, the um, 96 meter, I think it was, wasn't it, 96 meter motor yeah. yacht. I mean, that was in, that was a very long project. I thought it was 10 years. You were telling me the other day it was more like 20 for you. But I mean, even if it was just 10, an awful lot of things happened in 10 years. I mean, how on earth do you nail down at what point? You're going to say, nope, that's it. That's the technology we're having. Oh, you're right. I mean, that was, uh, I remember at the beginning of the, the project when it formally sort of started in 99, we had a project office and the computers arrived and they were big, deep screen you know, glass tubes. And uh, of course, none of us use those anymore. In fact, um, that was a project that happened in stages. So the first sort of five years was one project. And then the, the second five years was when it was actually in the shipyard having major work done to it. Um, with all of these big projects, they're designed and built in parallel. So you don't go into it with a fully, um, a fully designed anything. And you go into it with a concept of what you're trying to do, a specification that will be uh, very accurate in some areas and then purely a wish list type specification in other areas. And then the team that's involved will design as the boat is being built, hopefully to a schedule. Doesn't always happen that way. Um, and in terms of the electronics, be it uh, you know, lighting, entertainment, lab and comms, most of those will be done on a budget. So you'll sort of say roughly it's going to cost half a million for the bridge. And you probably won't know too much more than that at the moment that you start. And then maybe a year into the project, you'll start refining that and looking at things. But as Rachel said, I mean, we're, we're very sensitive to, to, to reliability. And all these, these boats aren't um, going through the kind of immense challenges of the, around the world solo kind of race. They are performing to a very high standard for the people who own them and charter them. And they need to be very reliable. So generally we're not cutting edge. The big thing that's happened for us, particularly on the classic yachts where we have very small bridges, is flat screen technology. It's made life mm. a hell of a lot easier for us. Um, and most things have got a lot smaller over time. And, and this you know, actually makes it possible to get the minimum equipment you require for class, class and flag into the same size bridge as the boat had 80 years ago, which we just couldn't have done um, in the old days. Just wouldn't mm. have been possible. Well, yeah, I really ought to get my hearing tested because for a minute I thought you said half a million for a bridge, but... Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't want to get that mistake wrong, would you? <laughs> Looking ahead into the future, Nigel, I mean, what, um, from a consumer point of view, or a con I mean, mass market point of view is what I mean, what can we expect? What are, what are going to be the big changes then? I think we're all heading towards now the, the glass bridge system, which is basically sheets of glass that you can do virtually anything with. You can control your engines, you can you, well, say control your engines, fully monitor your engines. You've got all your alarm systems coming up on there. You can control the lighting, the air con, your, your fuel tanks, whatever you want, as well as, of course, navigate with your charts up on there. You've got your radar, AIS systems, your autopilot, all built into these big flat screens. Very simple, such as you're looking at up on there. So you can control everything from there. The, the screen is totally versatile. Uh, something that was sort of science fiction just a few years ago is now very much here today. This particular boat here, you can walk on board with a key fob, press the button, and it will, set, it'll light up, 
Um, the, the lighting will come on to a prearranged setting. The, the music can come on, the air con, fridge turns on, cold beers are ready. Let's go. <laughs> what could go wrong? No. The, um, I mean, just looking at that, actually, I mean, it just makes me wonder if there's... A, is it easier to make a bridge waterproof now with systems like this? I mean, you don't have buttons and switches and seals to put in anymore. It, in many ways, that's true. You, the actual bridge itself, all you've got to do is seal around. The, obviously, the, the front fascias of all of these products are fully uh, waterproof. You, as I said before, you wash that down with a hose with, with no, no damage to it. Um, and that's what it's designed to do. It's, it's to, to be kept clean and, and efficient. It works. Mm, exciting stuff. Well, thank you very much to all of our panel. It's now um, over to you and your turn to ask some questions. Now, if you could raise your hand if you want to ask a question and uh, let us know uh, who you are. I have one here. Uh, I'm David Ball from Sunseeker. Um, is the future of yacht electronics going to be based on, uh, based on a personal approach where individuals bring their own nav, comms and entertainment systems on a tablet? Mm. Sounds like one for you, Nigel. I think it will be a mixture. I think people will, you, what, what it will head towards is a, the ability to take your own system on board the boat, but link into the onboard system so that you can use your system on board the boat. Um, you can do all your planning at home, you can get, get everything ready at home, then come on board the boat, link it into the onboard system, which will then be a more rugged system for, for uh, using on board the boat rather than at home. And, and William, I mean, people in, in the classic yachts and, and the super yachts, people are, well, a lot of people well, want to make their boats individual, don't they? I think as, at the super yacht level, there is a divide between guest and crew. And I think that, that we will always have the hardwired navigational systems in that the crew will rely on. And that's dictated really by regulations of our class and flag state require you to have on the bigger yachts. But there, that divide doesn't exist when you come to the entertainment where the crew are now bringing their own tablets on board because they want to watch movies or whatever. And the guests are doing exactly the same and they're using them to communicate and they have access to email the whole time and that's happening. On the sailing, we haven't talked about the sort of sailing class yacht, the smaller end of the market. One of the things that's fun there is that some of these boats that are being restored to exactly as they were built. I've got a 95 year old boat myself. It has nothing wired in, but we can take stuff you know, in plastic bags sometimes on board <laughs> and, and play around and see how we're doing. Um, so, so there is that aspect there that's making the very classic side of, 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 the, of, of the traditional boat market different because you can have modern electronics in a way that you couldn't have before. Mm, exciting. I think we had, there was a question in the middle. Did I say yes, the gentleman in the middle there? Thank you. Yes, there might be a question for Rachel about the reliability of autopilots, especially on these single-handed boats. It always seemed to be a weak point many years ago. Is it still that, the case to have to carry several... Um, systems with them? We, we do carry, um, we have two complete systems that are permanently installed and you can uh, change between either of those systems and you can also mix, mix and match the components of either of those systems, just a, uh, a simple sort of turn of a switch. Um, we also carry a couple of extra bits as well, but this sort of comes back to what I'm saying really about um, working very closely with the equipment manufacturers, um, having a really good understanding of what, if they've made any software updates, exactly what they're going to do, and testing everything rigorously before we actually release it for a race. Yes, because the problem was always with the multi hulls especially, and it wasn't a, probably a, a problem where the position of the boat was, but uh, you know, obviously you can't steer for three months non-stop. Exactly. <laughs> so it's a lot reliable now anyway. Yeah, I mean, touch wood, um, we're in a position where we're very, very confident in, in the autopilot systems. Thank you. Any more questions? Oh, hello, my name is Martin Rashford from the RNLI. Uh, quick question, really, with all the electronic integration and wireless and everything that's going in, what's the progress on sort of like security and that? Because obviously... We've all seen the nightmare films where someone hacks into a boat's systems and that takes control. Is that becoming a problem now with people hacking your systems remotely or even on board? I've never heard of anything like that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine. The boats, the boats themselves are pretty much self-sufficient um, self on their own. They're, they're, they're travelling. I don't see quite how you do it. Possibly only 
we're talking to, into satcoms and such such areas such as that, there might be a possibility. But I have to say, I've I've ne never come across it. It's an interesting thought, though. It's controlling it remotely from somewhere else. Yeah. I think um, at the bigger end of the market, that's very much an issue. And as the uh, the end of spike between safety and security, um, you need to get everybody else out of a boat, and you need to have firemen being able to access all parts of the boat. On the other hand, you need to keep everyone safe inside in the case that they have an unwanted visitor. Um, and a lot of these boats are running planned maintenance systems which are backed up ashore, particularly the ISM managed ones. Um, so boats over 500 tons. Now this is quite a, quite a real issue and many boats over 500 tons will now have a dedicated ETO and they have all the same issues I would say as a, as a mid-sized business with 20 to 30 employees. Um, they're running all the same problems apart from the fact that they're also waterborne and they also have the issues of uh, of confusion between boat systems where you have marinas full of yachts and you have you know, hundreds of crew walking around with electronic key fobs that are giving them access to doors and stuff like that. And it turns out that two or three of them are on the same settings. And yeah, all of this nightmare stuff happens. It absolutely does. And, uh, and there are, they're all the same problems as we have on shore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, I wondered about, uh, I mean, Wi-Fi is notoriously, well, some protocols in the Wi-Fi are notoriously easy to, to crack, aren't they? There's programs you can download quite easily off the net. And there seems to be a great, I mean, on race boats, I mean, on race boats, it's quite commonplace to have wireless networks on board a race yacht, isn't it, for the distribution of information? Yes, yeah, it's, it's very common. Um, I've seen a few funny scenarios where um, people have picked, people have managed, oh, if you've got several boats on a start line, uh, everyone's got a deck screen. Um, uh, some kind of tablet, um, people can actually interfere unintentionally with other boats' networks. Um, Who would think of doing that in a race situation? Uh, <laughs> Can't imagine anyone wants to do that. On super yachts, it tends to be more the owner deciding to go for a little naked swim in the middle of the night, and he sets off the alarms and cameras track him and all the rest of it, <laughs> and it's relayed live to the crew mess and immediately recorded and all the rest of it. So uh, we, we have our different problems. Any other questions? Another one up at the back there. Good afternoon, Duncan from Fairly Yachts. A bit of a philosophical question. I, like Matthew, have been involved in this industry for 30 odd years. In those 30 odd years, life has changed so much. All the electronic aids we have, communication aids, bow thrusters, stern thrusters, ignoring Williams yachts and the high-tech yachts. Are we making this industry so de-skilled that other issues of safety, uh, which perhaps the RNLI might like to comment on, um, this reliance on technology, and as you know, nothing ever goes wrong with electronics. <laughs> is, is, it, is this going to continue and continue and continue? then my five-year-old daughter can take a boat out? Well, there's an interesting one. That is the subject for next year's debate, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it is, it's, a very, no, it's a very interesting point that you raise. Um, what do we think? Well, we touched on this when we all met uh, to, mm -hmm. to, to, to decide how we were going to discuss this. And uh, I think that the consensus that we had there, and others should interrupt me if, if, if they have different views, but none of this takes away the requirement for some basic seamanship and experience of going to sea and boat handling and, and, and just knowing what you are doing as a seaman remains and everything else just helps you to do it maybe more easily, maybe not have to go to night class, but when you're in the middle of the channel and you're in the channels in the separation zone and there's a large ship bearing down on you and you're tired and you don't know what you're doing and it's blowing 35 knots, you're in trouble regardless of your electronics. So seamanship remains the same and the requirement for it is my view. Yeah. Mm. I think nothing beats the Mark 1 eyeball. No, thank God for that. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, uh, I've been told that we need to wrap up this, this particular session now. So thank you very much, Alex, William, Nigel, and Rachel. Thank you very much for your questions. And uh, I hope that's uh, made the future as clear as, well, as clear as it could be. Thanks very much.